So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's seminar titled Post-Processing and Visualizing Large Climate Model Data, Radio Nuclear Dispersion Modeling and High-Performance Computing. Our speaker today is Marco Miani, who is a computational support specialist at KSC of the Cypress Institute. His research interests are in numerical modeling of water waves, with his thesis dealing with predictability of numerical wave models for assessing the, the available energy potential of the Portuguese coast. His academic background is in physical oceanography earned at the University of Lisbon. During and after his studies, he has been working on mathematical and numerical modeling of water waves in both academic and commercial environments. After completing his master's degree, he has worked at the coastal research station on the island of Norderne in Germany as a technical research assistant at the University of Vienna, as a project engineer in the private sector, as well as the National Institute for Hydraulic Engineering, both of the aforementioned in Antwerp, Belgium. In addition to this, he has spent part of his career at the Joint Research Center in Ispra, Italy, and the Institute for Hydraulic Engineering in Aachen, Germany. His daily duties include the visualization, validation, and post-processing of model-generated large-scale scientific climate data. He is also involved in the adaptation and expansion of the numerical code for simulating atmospheric tracer dispersion in the Mediterranean area using HPC resources from the Cyprus Institute. Marco, thank you very much for agreeing to be our speaker today. Um, over to you. We're looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I was already introduced, so I uh, will uh, just skip the, um, the the first slide and go straight into the uh, content of this talk, which uh, will namely be an introduction. Then we will be talking about the large climate data, the structure, the retrieval and the processing. Then we will move to uh, the actual visualization of these data. And uh, we will then conclude the uh, talk by uh, addressing the uh, HPC, the high performance computing uh, for uh, the uh, dispersion modeling using uh, a numerical model called FlexBart. Uh, let's start with the introduction. These are the research topics uh, that keep me busy every day, as well as my responsibilities here at the uh, KRC, at the Climate and uh, Atmosphere Research Center at the Cypress Institute. And um, the most prominent are the atmospheric and climate earth modeling and the uh, scientific data visualization. Now, the, uh, today's talk will be orbiting around the climate data and a uh, question might be what turns data into actual climate data. So the uh, main distance, the, the, main, um, the, uh, the main answer for that is the, um, the, uh, the duration uh, and uh, the short term or the long term makes data uh, climate ready, so to say. Um, and uh, the collection of these measurements or uh, modeling results allows then to have a long-term statistics that uh, is agreed on to be 30 years. And that um, is what in essence makes um, short-term data like the weather into climate data. So if you start collecting uh, a lot of data, a lot of different variables. If you quality control them, if you make sure they are good data, then you can start collecting them and uh, having your um, uh, data set growing constantly on a daily basis. Uh, there is on the bottom of this page, a nice animation in case you uh, might want to dig deeper. And this animation shows in a very nice way how, for example, uh, weather can be a dog going up and down, moving erratically uh, across the street. And the climate could be the gentleman walking that dog, which is moving uh, slowly and uh, trying not, not matching the uh, very erratic move of the dog, but rather going slowly up and down. So the um, climate data we will be uh, viewing today, uh, they are large. That's one thing they are. And we also will be having a look at their structure and how they are being retrieved and processed. 
uh, when it comes to climate data, there are two big families. One is the, um, the data uh, obtained from uh, mathematical modeling, which is called numerical modeling. And uh, the other big family are observations, which can be remote or in situ. Now, for the numerical modeling, uh, we, uh, for example, today will be addressing uh, climate data that are retrieved from uh, um, an electronic shelf, which uh, I will be uh, presenting in a minute. But for what concerns numerical models, we have, for example, that they uh, typically cover the whole globe and uh, as well as the vertical. So we have a grid that it's actually a sphere, a volume. And uh, in this case, uh, for the data that are used, are being used as an input for FlexPart, they cover 20, 34 vertical levels. And since they are defined over a 0 0.25 degrees grid, they, uh, they have 361 times 740 grid points. Um, of course, they also span over a large period, in this case, 15 years, and they uh, enclose a very large number of variables. So that makes you think, that might give you an idea of how immense this data set can be. If you have a look at the uh, bottom of the slide, you will see a scale where you have the increasing size and the uh, data set I was mentioning before uh, is lying around uh, 10 to the power of nine and 10 to the power of 10 bytes, which is a very large amount of data um, and occupies a great amount of space on disk. Now to uh, process that, to analyze that, to extract information from that, the format in which these data are stored is of great help. Um, namely, the um, data that climate data, the, the format that climate data are typically stored in are binary data, so binary formats. And uh, there are many formats available out there. Uh, two of them we will be addressing today more in detail. One of them is NetCDF, which stands for Network Common Data Form. And the other one is a GRIP2 version 2, which is replacing version 1, which means a gridded binary. There are as well some other formats that, uh, for example, are HDF. Uh, developed by NASA. And uh, what all these data, these formats share, are they are very high memory efficiency. They are all very quickly accessible. They're cross-platform. Cross They're non-human readable. So do not imagine that you have a text file or an Excel file containing all this data. There would be no chance of storing all, storing all that much information into uh, something non-binary. So we need a specific container that is being used for just that purpose. Um, and again, the above formats, they greatly help when post-processing. Now, about the NetCDF format, uh, there are four salient features that I would like to stress here. They are, for example, self-describing which means that they have attributes, metadata, which is data describing data. They are portable, oh, which makes them very easy to, uh, which makes it very easy for them to be uh, shared. They are scalable. So it means that they work very well when the size increases uh, dramatically, like it happens uh, many times in, in the business and they're appendable. So once you create one, you can start adding new information even with a new structure, how to say, let me address that later, even with a new structure to the already existing one. As in every slide, you will see at the bottom that there are some references. If you want more information about it, at the end of this presentation, there are three pages of references and you can use that to dig a bit deeper if you want. So all this feature make the NetCDF format and a so-called array-oriented format, which is very, easy to access, it's very structured, and uh, this very structure helps in uh, understanding and uh, figuring out what the content is and how that is organized. Now imagine 
that you have a big amount of data, like the one I had mentioned before. So a grid that extends over the whole globe for uh, a lot of grid points in uh, the latitude direction, a lot of grid points in the longitude direction, a lot of vertical levels for a lot of time steps. So for example, six hours, every six hours over 15 or 30 years, and for at least 25 or 30 variables. Now to contain all that information, you need not only something very efficient, memory efficient that contains that, but you also need to know what the content is. Um, and you need something that's called metadata, which is again, data describing data. So you have, for example, this little cube here that you're seeing that might represent an instance an example of what uh, data are or how they are stored. So this volume here represents one time step for one variable over the whole globe. And again, you have a lot of time steps, a lot of variables. And of course, this matrix here, this cube is much bigger and much denser. So there really is the need to have something that is efficiently storing and uh, returning data when queried. Uh, the uh, metadata I was mentioning before could be uh, anything regarding the size, the dimension, the type of data, the unit, the reference system, the time reference, or even the space and time convention. These are all information that not only are useful and needed by uh, whoever is working with the data, but also from some machines that are ingesting these data and need to know what is contained in it. So there needs to be um, a kind of guidance, a menu, so to say, describing the content, the very content of these data. What you see here is the um, output of the function called ncdump. So ncdump, in, uh, if you open up in a terminal in Linux and have the library installed, uh, if you uh, mm, retrieve this function and use it for, with any netcdf file, adding this flag here, minus h, which stands for a header only, it will return you the description of the content, not the numerical values, but what you have. So whenever you uh, put your hands on something or whenever you download something or whenever a colleague shares some data with you, you want to know what the content is. You want to inspect that, you want to explore it. And uh, what you have here is the, for example, a description of all the dimensions or the dimensional rank you have. And uh, in this case, you have an, uh, 336 time steps, uh, but it's listed here as unlimited. That's because that CDF are appendable. So you can keep adding on top of that. Then you have some information about latitude and longitude, which do not change over time. So it stays constant. The grid, the dimension of the grid stays constant over time. Then uh, you, for example, have information about height, the uh, number of species, the um, uh, information about the release points or points uh, or the receptors. These file that you see here, the output uh, of the file you see here uh, belongs to the Flexbar output. So whenever you are generating a NetCDF file with Flexbar, if you have the libraries installed, uh, will contain this information here. So it gives you, it returns information about the content, what you have, um, how big that is, how many points you have in each dimension. And as well, along uh, with the global variables, you also have the uh, specific variables, which as well, just like any other variable has metadata, like um, for example, time or longitude. Uh, for longitude, you might, for example, see that you have it defined in degrees, uh, degrees east, and um, you have the grid cell centers, and you have description about the axis, the units, the long name, you have short name, long names. I didn't put it here, but you also have arrow flags uh, or missing values uh, and many, many other fields that for brevity, I decided not to include here. But still, this gives a very good description of what the metadata are and how you treat them with, for example, ncdump, this function. Now, talking about conventions, 
there is one very important convention that in uh, this um, sector here in this business, it's called CF, which stands for Climate and Forecast. And uh, for any uh, variable, for every aspect of that variable, if you want your data to be CF compliant, uh, they need to be and they have to have all the subfields, fields and subfields you see here. So that uh, the uh, software that is taking in the data knows what to expect. So uh, if you are using some kind of software that is expecting to take in uh, net CDF data in CF format, you have to make sure you have to promise that software that it will find uh, a given number of quantities uh, organized in a given way and that everything will just be as that software expects it to be. Um, and this is very, uh, yeah, it's very common in uh, when working with climate data, you are um, working with big data, so you need to have it very well structured. Uh, you also have some online CF checkers, uh, if you have a look at the bottom of the page, and you can just upload your data set here and see if or not that is CF compliant. Uh, also, you have a list of other softwares that understand, so to say, CF convention. Now, all this, when we bring it together, makes our data fair. And uh, this is a slide extracted from one talk I gave last year, and um, that presented the principle of fair data. Fair data are findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And NetCDF data certainly are because they have all the metadata describing the content. They are very easily findable. We will see that in a minute. They are accessible. So they are cross-platform. They are non-proprietary, which means that you don't need to buy any license to read it or even to write it. You can create, if you have your little weather station at home and you're sampling data, you can store that in NetCDF if you want. Um, about the uh, research data archive. This is one great big source of net CDF data as well as many other formats uh, for climate data. So this is a free access big data center and you will find the link on the very bottom of this page. And you can find climate data that range from atmosphere to ocean to land cover, to ice sheet cover, to agriculture, different climate indices. And you really have a very, very, very big uh, electronic shelf on which you can just grab the data you need for your research or your study. Uh, again, once you authenticate and uh, provide name, surname, affiliation, and role, you are granted the right to grab those data, just to take them and uh, they are very well documented. Each data set is documented. So within this RDA, you have different data sets, which if you look closer in the slide, you will see that is goes under the name of DS. And then you have a number, a dot, and another number. That's the um, identification code for each data set. And that can be measurement, that can be uh, uh, model that can be uh, remote sensed data, you can find virtually anything. And since the um, amount of data is so big and uh, so immense, when you download it, don't think that it's something you can do like downloading a PDF or a song from the internet. You really need to have um, a specialized access point to download that. So there are two ways. And if you're interested in that, I can show you something, uh, some more details later. There are two ways for RDA when you're accessing to download data. One is a gr graphical user interface where you start clicking a series of names and dates and uh, levels and products. And uh, you uh, throw a box on a map uh, if you want a subregion. And that's how we download it via the graphical user interface. Or the second way, um, NCAR has uh, developed a Python-based API client, which you can download. 
and you can use to code your own request, which means that you generate a control file, which is a simple text file, five lines containing some very elementary details, where, when, what, you take that file, you read it in in Python, and you submit that. Uh, once your request is ready, because they need to ex extract that from their uh, tapes, they make it available, they extract information for you, you receive an email, and uh, you can download it via Python. So there's no clicking. Uh, what you see here on the left column, top left, is the total number of unique users for each data set. And top right is the volume of downloaded data, again, for each data set. This was done past months. The data set I am using is DS083.3, which is the third from above. And uh, for example, on the right column, you see that there are 35.2 terabytes downloaded. And I think one or two of them are uh, here on my machine. Now, the uh, research data archive, again, the actual content of the data is a compressed file. It's a very big one. And on the uh, bottom of this page, you see the size the data set, the size of the data set in gigabytes. And on the vertical axis, you see the uh, request the needed download time in minutes to download it. And as expected, you see that the greater the file size, the more it takes to download it. And this is again for the S083.3, the um, FNL, the uh, Operational Global Analysis and Forecast. And the uh, marker size indicates the number of files contained in the compressed file. So with, of course, increasing uh, data size, you have a larger number of composing elements. And on top left, you see that, uh, as expected, again, the data size scales linearly with the time span that that data set covers. Um, uh, in my case, for data set 0 and 3.3, I have downloaded 18 variables for the special coverage is global at 0 0.25 degrees. I have 34 isobaric vertical levels, and I have uh, the uh, analysis at three hours, the um, uh, forecast, and the average as well the, as the accumulation. We will see about that later a bit more in detail. Again, here there are some references if you're interested in digging more. Now, when it comes to this very, very large data set, ah, sorry, excuse me, um, these little arrow here, the orange one, indicates the typical size range of uh, input data for FlexBart, because of course I'm downloading all this to be used and ingested in FlexBart. And uh, this guy here is about 30 days in uh, time span. So I'm running my model uh, in 30, 30 days. And that's more or less the size of one uh, yeah, chunk of data. And uh, it takes about one hour to be downloaded, uh, one hour and a half, more or less. It also depends how busy the, uh, the network is. Anyhow, when it comes to this very, very big uh, data set, we have the most prominent three, at least, mm, uh, tools to um, process that. and. Um, these are namely CDO, EC codes, and WGRID2. Now, these all these gentlemen here can encode and decode, which means read and write, and they are extremely fast. Uh, they um, are happy to take in GRIP or NetCDF data, and um, they are uh, very versatile, very flexible, and they can do a lot of things for you. Um, other tools that I decided to include here are the uh, GeoCAD or uh, the uh, NCO, which are again uh, the um, NetCDF operators. And the other one is a Swiss knife, so to say, by uh, NCAR Common Language, the uh, new version of NCL. Uh, the spirit all of this is that uh, all these tools are open. So they are open source and they belong to the open science, mentality, open science mentality. So whatever we are doing, the data we are retrieving 
the models that we are using, the tools that we are using to visualize those data, it's all open. It's nothing proprietary. So if you want, uh, in theory, to uh, redo every step that someone publishes, you can do it. And there is nothing mm, uh, holding you back, except maybe the time it takes to produce it. And um, again, all these tools here are cap capable of encoding and decoding. And all of them, all the three of them listed here on the top, they are also um, usable in Python. Now that we have seen uh, how the processing of these data set works, let's have a look at what the visualization is. I would like to present to you something that I have been working on last year. This was a very interesting project. We had um, one numerical model that emitted uh, for different points over the globe at a global scale and for 20 years. And we wanted to analyze what would happen with the um, concentration of that tracer uh, and speculate about the uh, climatology of that. So, for example, we had iodine-134-31, which is one of the tracers emitted. And the way to do, the way to achieve my goal would, was namely extracting the ground level of that data, because as mentioned, the model has many vertical layers. Um, defining a risk index, so normalizing the fields, which means that you divide each grid point by the maximum globally uh, that is encountered for that very time step. And once you have that index, you can start extracting, extracting either the monthly mean, the seasonal mean, if you want the daily mean, or you can start working on that. And you see that you have if you want to do this in, in Python and in conventional common canonical code, you have to do a lot of coding and there is a lot of uh, looping and uh, you have to do it for every variable. You have to extract, you have to make sure that the time axis fit and uh, it's not easy. You have to do it for um, all the years, retain the months that belong to that season, so on and so forth. Now, this is fairly complicated and tedious sometimes. Meanwhile, in CDO, the three steps to do that is select the level 34, extract the variable called I131, normalize the fields, and extract the monthly mean, period. Nothing more than that. And that's how easy it is to do with CDO. And that is to demonstrate how good it can be uh, having tools that are very, very efficient, very fast, and in a very robust way, they can get you very easily to, uh, to your goal. So the uh, point number two is, for example, uh, um, the syntax for Python, because again, I mentioned before that CDO is Python compatible. So not only you can run this from uh, the command line, but if you wish, you can also do that from Python. And again, this is working with NetCDF. This is based on uh, Fortran and C++ libraries. Uh, so it's extremely fast. This is uh, being developed, was developed, and is being developed by uh, the uh, Germans, the uh, Max Planck Institute in Hamburg, and they're doing a great job. The fourth step, this was just to demonstrate how CDO, for example, can work with multi-threading. And uh, uh, you have to specify the, um, uh, the threading, the uh, format, and the compression factor. CDO has 600 different operators and has a lot of different flags. It's very flexible. And uh, if you're working with climate data, it can really, really help you, help you out in, uh, in doing what you want to do in a very fast, safe, and uh, robust way. If you're interested, later I uh, have prepared some backup slides that can give you uh, more insight on CDO. Now, the result of all this, of the uh, visualization of the uh, relative risk index, is, ladies and gentlemen, this. And um, this is done just in a few seconds. So 
um, it's very easy. And you see that the relative risk index, which is normalized, so it means that varies from zero to one, was converted here, was just multiplied by 100 to make it more uh, intuitive, more understandable. And you see that the emission point in this case is somewhere in the, uh, in the Emirates. And uh, these figures here, I have been using it last year uh, when uh, presenting, when submitting some conference paper. And despite being some remarks on the strategy and the content and, and the methodology, they had no objections at all about the quality of the figures. So if you are interested in uh, getting something publication ready and very of very high quality, you can certainly go for, um, for NCL, which produces great graphics, can be at the raster or vector. And uh, yeah, as you can see, it really makes a difference as well as, uh, the great control you have on every single possible parameter and aspect. Now, another uh, animation, an another example I would like to show you is the animation of the results. So of this relative risk index, not only you can do figures, static figures, but you can also do animations with something that again is open source, called uh, Paraview, which is the software that animates large data, typically net CDF and climate science. And from a bunch of numbers, from a notion of numbers, you can put it in a way that it's very, very understandable, very clear and very nice to see, which never hurts. So in my case, I've been, uh, the two tracers I've been working on for the study case I mentioned before was iodine and cesium. Now, the uh, physical mechanism governing the dispersion and the accumulation of either tracer are different. For iodine, which is a gas, you have the half, half, half la lifetime of eight days, and it's residing in the atmosphere. For cesium, which is aerosol, the uh, accumulation spans over uh, uh, the whole simulation period, so 20 years and the decay time is about 30 years. So it deposits on the ground and it can really have adverse consequences. So the way of visualizing it, it's different. And I would like to show you if the machine allows me to. Let me see, maybe here, yep. So, all this, what you see is obtained in Paraview and you have your data that are overlapped to a high resolution image of this wonderful planet. And you have the coastline and you have your data staying there. This is cesium, which is not time varying because it's the accumulation of the, um, of the last time step. And uh, you can see how, yeah, uh, what you can achieve with all this. Uh, which makes it also very understandable and very, it's, it's very intuitive. Now, if we go a bit on, this is, this is the time varying uh, animation of the iodine. And you see how this disperse. Now that was on a sphere, this is on a planar view. And you can see how good that is. So how easy it is to understand uh, where the plume arrives and what time. And uh, with this Paraview software, it's, you can do a lot of stuff and it's a really powerful tool that you can use uh, to visualize your data. Now, let me just go back to the full screen mode. Yeah. Again, there is a reference here on the top left if you're interested in digging more. Another example I would like to propose you is the output of the WRF model, which for our case for Cyprus, we are running in nested domains, which means that we take the regional, regional scale and within that mother domain, we start nesting. So um, allocating other smaller grids with higher resolution and we do it for three steps. So the step change, you see it on the top right, it's 50, 10 and two kilometers. So each grid point is 50, 10 or two kilometers apart. Uh, 
and um, of course there would be uh, no chance of running it uh, on a regional scale at two kilometer resolution what you do the way to go is to nest it and that's what we are doing here so you have three domains and uh, we call them d1 d2 and d3 they are shown here in different colors with the resolution and uh, for Cyprus, which is the red one here, what I have is this, which is dust plumes obtained by WRF models. And you have maps and vertical profiles. So as mentioned, again, WRF has um, 30 and something, 32 or 34 vertical levels. And uh, what we are seeing here is the dust concentration over Cyprus at a very high resolution. Now, not only we are interested in the map, uh, which is also showing the winds for that time step and for that level, but also we are interested, for example, in a vertical profile. So if you're looking down through all the layers, okay, so all the vertical levels for one point and for one time step, you get what you see on your right-hand side, which is a vertical profile. And that informs you about the uh, concentration over the vertical. And you have on the uh, vertical axis, the uh, numbered levels and the corresponding altitude. And you see that the model is going very high to about 20 kilometers. And you also see that uh, the uh, actual concentration of the dust is not exceeding the four kilometers in height for this case. And uh, why have I been doing all this? Not only because I very much like uh, figures and maps, but also because some colleagues that are operating our drones, they need to know when they take off where to go and especially at what altitude they should have the drone flying. So they know that for each flight, uh, they can optimize the flight route and they know that if, you're, if they are flying at the right altitude, they will get the best measurements. Or they also know what heights they should avoid. Uh, so this is one of the little projects I uh, have been involved in, a very interesting one. And uh, they want to use the model forecast on a daily basis to optimize the flight routes. Okay, so what we're seeing here is level five. You see it here on the vertical profile and the maximum here is at level five for Orunda, which is where the airfield is. And this is what it looks like on a map. Now that we have addressed all this, we can finally move on to the HPC and the dispersion modeling using flex parts. Uh, in, um, the, uh, bibli in the, uh, yeah, in the bibliography, there is one very interesting scientific article which um, argues uh, about the uh, release from a hypothetical accident in uh, Akuyu nuclear power plant. Akuyu is a power plant built in South Turkey, which is just 92 kilometers away from uh, the uh, coast, northern coast of Cyprus. And um, they speculate about uh, the uh, scenarios, what would happen uh, where the plume of radionuclides would arrive and with what concentration if something, if ever something should go wrong. And uh, one of the very interesting conclusions they draw is that different meteorolo meteorological data are likely to reveal different results, even if all other parameters are kept constant. So, um, the uh, reference for this is again here. You can see it in the reference list. And um, they have done the study using uh, um, a, a data set which is, uh, has a um, definition, a resolution of 0 0.5 degrees and in space and six hours in time. Now, uh, we have decided here to. Uh, try to redo that study. And since these meteorological data set are, were found to be so important, we decided to use a um, um, higher resolved input data set, which is twice as much uh, in, time, in time and space as the one used by the uh, Turkish colleagues. You see it here. So with old 
you have the pink one with improved, you have the blue one. And uh, we are redoing the same study with this new data set uh, or with this new input, so to say. And also for this case, I have been, I'm, I'm still working on something called FlexPy, which is a Python-based package that sets up, uh, prepares the input and retrieves the data from the RDA automatically. So since the uh, runs over the whole 15 years will be a lot, I, to make a favor to myself, I didn't want to do it manually. I just wanted to persuade the machine and have it understanding how the setup should be. Then providing just uh, the, uh, some very basic input data like about space and time and about the uh, release and about the uh, chemical and physical uh, features of the tracers, I could just persuade a machine to prepare and run all the cases uh, contained in those 15 years. Now, why Cyprus? So these are the images you see here, and you see that a very big part of um, Eastern Europe is interested and affected by that. And you see here in the image that the uh, emission points emitting power plant in South Turkey is of highest concentration. And uh, again, we thought that Cyprus would be a good study case and we wanted to see what would happen to Cyprus, just the colleagues have never included Cyprus in the map in their study. So that was one other good reason to redo the study and uh, this time include the island with an uh, improved, highly resolved uh, data set. Again, DS083.3. The uh, three objectives for this study are, of course, creating um, daily, weekly, or seasonal climatology uh, to be then used uh, to uh, draw our conclusions. Uh, and then, of course, to share with, with the uh, policymakers and decision makers. And the uh, second objective was to compare those results with the available bibliography. And this is a purely research related speculation. The third objective, just as important, is um, having ready on shelf something that can be very readily used in case something really bad happens. So instead of rerunning the model and waiting for the result and processing that, we have it already there. And uh, if someone needs it, we just take it and we send it via email, for example, and they know what they should expect. Now FlexPart. FlexPart is the numerical tool. It's a numerical machine with this time marching mechanism that is uh, being used to speculate and to simulate and to produce the, uh, the results we are presenting here today. And it's a Lagrangian dispersion model, which means that it can easily simulate atmospheric transport, turbulent mixing, aerosols, and as well dust, which is a big deal here in Cyprus or in general in this region on Earth. Uh, in principle, you have a particle that during its journey is affected by um, loss, uh, be it uh, dry or wet deposition, chemical loss, or uh, radioactive decay. And uh, these processes may or may not affect the mass of that particle. Uh, the uh, great deal about the Lagrangian dispersion models is that they can do trajectories. So you can go backward in time and speculate doing inverse modeling about the uh, provenience of what you are measuring at some point. So for example, if we are modeling, if we are measuring uh, pollen on the rooftop of NTL here at the Cypress Institute, we might as well speculate about where that pollen comes from. Um, and of course, there are some technical considerations about uh, how the uh, computation time scales and that on a very first approximation depends on linearly on the number of particles used. Now, just to present you a very, very, very brief uh, uh, outline of the governing equations, you have that the position of the particle analyzed at the time t plus delta t, it depends on the uh, position of time t plus the increment 
uh, that the velocity, the advection uh, contributes with over that uh, time jump. And uh, during that journey, you have, for example, the time loss, the, sorry, the mass loss during that time uh, attributable to wet deposition. So uh, after dt seconds, you have an exponential decay of the mass. If you're interested in more references, you can find them uh, and in the list at the end. This here shows in um, a very schematic way what uh, we had in mind here. So for all the 15 years, what we want to do is run the model for 15 days and the emission would just last 10 days. And uh, we do that for all the 15 days slots contained in 15 years. That's why it was mentioned before, the number of runs is immense and I have no intention to do it manually. So I've been uh, developing something that does it for me. Uh, you see here on the left side that uh, the uh, scenario, that's how we want to stack them. So the same geographic area for the same um, conditions, so to say, with different meteorological inputs. We stack all that, and once we have a large enough number of runs, we can start extracting means. So based on all the runs we have, uh, or we still want to do, uh, we can then start thinking about uh, climatological means. And that would then inform us about where the pool would arrive with what intensity. Now that little thing, that little flex bar thing, flex by Python package I was mentioning before, this here on the bottom right is one example of what is capable of. So when you set up the model, you just prescribe the vertical levels, the output grid, uh, the uh, dates you want, uh, you give some technical uh, details to Python and he will just set up the model for you with all the subfolders, folders and subfolders, run folders, input data, um, prepare everything. And uh, you see here that in this case, we have the computational grid, the output grid, which is over Cyprus with the emission point, which is the red star on the South Turkish coast. And two receptors. One is the Cyprus Institute in blue, the other one is Kerinya, Kerinya Kestol uh, in the north. Uh, you also have the description of uh, the, in this case, seven vertical levels with their values in meter and the release points, which is not very easy, easily seeable here, but it's slightly above the five meters. And in this case, it's uh, 150 meters above ground level. So it gives you a good snapshot, snapshot of what you have, what you are about to run, and how the model is being set up. Now, the difference between uh, all the new, so to say, input data is that if you have a six-hour temporal definition, um, you might be missing something, and you might not be able to resolve how, uh, for example, something like temperature, which is rapidly varying, you might not be able to, resor to, to uh, resolve how uh, the uh, crucial input parameters vary. And uh, you can see it here, you have three close-ups and uh, you really see how better it is to include the uh, three hours forecast. So at each six hours, you have a three hours forecast which if combined with the original data ends up giving a three hours dense time series. So this is based on the improved version of the global forecast system uh, sourced from the RDA, which I have been uh, talking about before. It's also very important to consider the uh, computation time versus the number of processors. So I've been running flex parts in MPI in parallel on our glorious HPC facility using the AMD EPIC cluster and the results I have obtained are shown here. So depending on how many processors per node I have been requesting, the uh, computation duration varies accordingly. And you see that 
for example, for each sequence or for each test case, I repeated that five times. So you have some variation because sometimes the machine is busy or there are just some, some, some uh, asynchronies. Uh, you have different responses, but in general, the uh, optimum is 25 processors per node. And uh, that is how I have been running the model and will be running it in the future to do all my runs. Now, just very briefly, this is an example of the uh, input file, the common file with all the definitions, the uh, all the um, uh, numerical uh, knobs you can uh, tune and twitch, and uh, as well as the output grid request where you say that your grid should start at this latitude and longitude with this number of points, with this spacing, and with this vertical levels. Okay, now that we have um, addressed all this, let's have a look at the results. These here are the results for just one run. This is not the climatology. This is the actual outcome of one run. And um, this uh, run was for 2019, October, day two, time zero, at uh, 50 meters above ground level. So what you see here is the normalized concentration with the same uh, with the same methodology I had uh, presented before. So you normalize the field by the maximum emission value, and um, what you see here is the receptor, the source, the wind fields at the level of the PBL, so the uh, planetary boundary layer, and the concentration at 50 meters above ground level after 23 hours into the simulation. So after one day, what happens with the concentration? The red line you see here is the, is the streamline passing through the emission point. Now you see that the concentration trails follows the wind. Okay, if the wind is blowing from your left to your right side, you have that the concentration which is transported and affected by the wind will just follow that. And um, you also have that when you visualize data, you just, you're just showing one slice. In this case, it's Z equals 50. And you might want to know at what vertical level the highest concentration is. So the contour lines you see here, they inform you where the maximum concentration is, which is not corresponding to what you are actually seeing here. Right, so um, in this case, after one day, if the wind is not strong enough, you have this plume spreading left and right. And uh, after two days for the same vertical level, you have this. And uh, you see that, again, the emission point was at 150, so 100 meters above what you see here. So maybe if we had analyzed or visualized the uh, level Z, Z equaled 150, we would have seen something different. In this case, the wind seems to be very intense, blowing steadily from left to right. And this is the result we have. And we can see here the little trail going along the wind streamline. One other very interesting result I have, I'm sure there are many, I just do have to uh, chop it down to a reasonable number. It's, um, it's this. So we are still emitting here. This is for ground level, so very close to ground level, 0 0.5. And um, despite being still emitting here because the emission lasted for 10 days, so 240 hours, sorry, we have that here the emission at the emission point is not yellow, so it's not one. That's because we're just seeing the bottom of it. If we moved up to 150, we would surely see here something yellow. And again, you can see here how the wind uh, dominates the dispersion of the plume. You can see the wind, uh, the swirls here, and uh, how this is affected and brought down towards the south by the wind, and how this trail here is more or less, the high concentration is moving along the winds. The second one, this is after the emission has ended. And you see that something, not much, is reaching Cyprus. So it's good to have Cyprus included because we want to know what reaches us if something in Turkey goes wrong. 
And as well, what is very interesting, after the emission, so about one day after the emission for iodine, we see that the highest concentration, close to one, or equal even to one, hits the coast here. This is, should be Syria. So you have that even after emitting a very dangerous uh, plume has arrived and hit land. And uh, that is one crucial information the policymaker might need to have when, uh, when trying to tackle this problem and to find solutions for that. The last image I want to show you again, you see again how the winds here after the emission has stopped. Uh, you see again how one of the plumes uh, is moving away from the emission point. And again, you see that the uh, topography here plays an important role because where there is no topography, you have no concentration. This is more or less comparable to the uh, um, altitude of the emission point. And you have almost no concentration where you have sea. And then when there comes the interaction with the land, you have that something keeps trapped and uh, you have that uh, maybe the big plume has passed away, but still something remains stuck there like it happens here and uh, on the uh, coast, coast of, I think this is Lebanon. And um, so this gives a good insight of what we might expect if something should ever go wrong, which I don't hope so. And uh, with this last image, my presentation has concluded. Again, you have some references here. Please use them if you wish to know more. And of course, I have prepared some backup slides. So in case you have any questions, I would be more than happy to answer them. I thank you very, very much for your attention. And I hope you find this interesting. Thank you. Um, thank you, Marco, for your presentation. Uh, it was good to see some of the aspects that Casey is working on and uh, scary to see what might happen in <laughs> case there's an accident in the future, which hopefully yeah. there won't be. Yeah. Um, if there's any questions for Marco, if you can, uh, from the audience, uh, please raise your hands or unmute. So nobody has any questions? Oh, Vangelis has, of course. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Marco. It was very, very interesting. This, you covered many different topics. Thank you, Vangelis. So just, uh, just a couple of questions. First, a very general one. So yeah. uh, what about the, the, let's say, sensitivity of your data to noise or to, to error, error in measurements and in model predictions as well? I mean, I was just wondering, I mean, for out of that, out of the data, you want to get, let's say, policy also, uh, guidance, right? Yeah. So how sensitive are these to, to, the, to the errors for such a chaotic system? This is a very interesting question. I thank you for asking that. Uh, that is one thing I would like to explore in the future. I have not had the chance to do it now, but it's surely one thing I should and would like to address. So one of the next steps will also be finding out some uh, available and uh, good quality measures that I might source on, or put my hands on and then compare that and see what would happen. So how good the data are, how, how good the model is capable of reproducing that. And um, again, nothing, nothing done so far with that respect, but it's surely something I want to do in the future. So you have not yet included, let's say, any stochasticity effects in, in, in this model. Can you repeat? I have not yet included. So I, I, I was just wondering whether there are some any stochasticity, let's say, stochastic effects involved in this uh, in the models as well. There are a lot of parameterizations, but the um, yeah, the performance against the uh, measurements. No, I cannot. I cannot say anything about it yet because I have not done anything with that respect yet. Okay, and if I may do a, another one, it's a little bit more technical. So in this uh, flex rate, if I'm not wrong, this is a Lagrangian dispersion model, mm -hmm. where you don't include any interaction between particles, right? 
There is the uh, decay time. So you have the residence of the tracer in the atmosphere and you uh, impose, you prescribe a decay time and um, based on the half life cycle of the, uh, the particle, you have um, yeah, a, a diminution, uh, uh, a degradation in concentration over time and over space. Mm -hmm. no, I'm just wondering why you don't get, let's say, um, you have, a, if, I, if I'm not wrong, you present a rather poor scaling up of the algorithm when you are above, let's say, 20 processors. So what is the reason for this? Go back. You hear, you mean? Yeah. Since you don't have any, that, that was, I'm just curious, since you don't have any, let's say, direct interaction, what is the reason of that you cannot really scale up the algorithm for, uh, for more processors? I think this has to do with the optimization of the code or the processes involved, surely. And is this uh, a domain decomposition paradigm? Hmm. Do you know how the parallelization is performed? Uh, the, um, I, I would like to get back to you in, I need to understand it better. So to, to dig better and I would like to get back to you to answer that question uh, more in detail. No worries, okay, no, no problem. Just curious. Thanks, Marco. Thanks. Thank again. you. So does anyone else have any other questions for Marco? Uh, can I ask? Yeah, Jakob, go ahead. About this plot, um, so did you also test the um, scalability with uh, on multiple nodes or just no, on... just uh, one node? Ah, I see. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe going to multiple nodes um, help could help. Sometimes, I mean, I, I saw that AMD's Apex can be quite tricky. For... Because of That's the definitely a good advice. I there are so many things still that I need and would like to try out. I just time I'm lacking, so at some point I will hopefully get to that. Yeah. Okay. This epic cluster is it a system that KC has? Yeah, uh, we have. Yes, we have the oh. uh, KC, and I think the whole institute can access that. Just KC. Yeah. Just that. How big is it? Because I didn't know about it until today. I was wondering what it was. We have six, uh, 80, pros, uh, 80 nodes. 80 okay. nodes we have. Okay, that's good. <laughs> okay, it's only CPU based, there's no GPUs. It's only uh, CPUs, yeah. Okay, have you tried your codes on GPUs or not? No. No, no, not yet. Um, is there any development for that? I, I don't think uh, flex parts can work on GPU. Okay. So I was going to ask on the correctness of the data. Obviously, the data that sensors receive that are used in the uh, database that you um, showed earlier that are yeah. stored in the database and that you use in your models. Um, obviously, that's the data that was sensed and recorded by sensors and sent and so on. But is there any um, ways of correcting that data in case there was a freak event and for some reason the data was wrong for a couple of days? So it's not part of the climate. Um, so it was recorded data, but it wasn't. Um, normal data you would expect if you know what i mean i know it's analysis so it's not reanalysis and uh, i think they are not including massively the uh, the measurements they had for okay. uh, for the past so i think the uh, correction is limited okay so any other questions for marco today from anyone else That doesn't be, appear to be the case. So I would like to thank our speaker, Marco, uh, for his time and for his presentation today.
Uh, if anyone has any questions for him further, they can contact him. He has some extra uh, slides uh, with more information. And obviously we will put uh, the presentation uh, online and he has included all the links uh, for the software and the data and so on. Uh, and people can follow up on that. So thank you all for joining today. Thank you. Thank and you I again. would like to contact uh, Vangelis to uh, get back on his question. Thank I you very much. Sir. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you all. And thank you, Marco, for your time. And bye bye for today. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you all. Bye.